What up, fam? Welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. In today's episode, I decided to check off one of the more requested builds and also get one step closer to a more complete suit of armor. So feast your eyes on my Greaves of Might! That's right, these bad boys are 100% guaranteed to make you run faster, jump higher, all while supplying you with plus two defense against low tables in dark rooms. Now I'm specifically gonna cover how I designed this knot work here, as well as a lot of these dyeing techniques, which were totally new to me. That being said, if you are new to leather working and you're just finding this show for the first time, I highly recommend you check out this playlist here. Those videos just kind of go into more detail on some of the techniques that I just kind of glance over here. All right, now that we got all those pleasantries out of the way, let's level up this skill. Drawing the design. So right off the bat, I knew I kind of wanted there to be a knot work design, but I really wanted to make it myself. That being said, don't feel like you have to. If you just kind of want to get a design on there and you have something online that you really like, just go for that. But we level up skills on the show, so I'm going to learn how to do it myself. So for starters, I made a super rough sketch on what I wanted it to look like. This is more just to get the bones of the image down. But here's my secret to get it as perfect as possible while doing it by hand. Come closer. Graph paper, yo. By using this paper, even a no talent hack like me can make a pretty fetching little design, if I do say so myself. I began by dividing the page in half, then evenly dividing the max width of the piece. Using my sketch as a guide, I started drawing one of my vines in, trying to make sure I hit the vertices of the squares whenever possible. Hitting the vertices of the squares isn't necessary, it just makes it a little bit more dummy proof for me, I guess. From there, I was able to count how many squares I went through and make a mark on the opposite side to shoot for. Then I just aimed my lines and hit those marks. So basically, once I have a mark drawn on one side of that dividing line, I can then count how many squares from that center it is and, and count that many squares on the opposite side so that I mirror those pieces exactly. By doing this, I was able to mirror my sides fairly accurately. Then I just went back over my drawing and thickened up those vines as I pleased. Now following one strand at a time, I drew in lines to represent it going over and under other strands across. So basically, I would just follow one of these vines and say like, all right, it went under this time, so the next time it'll go over, then the time after that it'll go under, and I just continue that pattern all the way down. Then I just repeated it for each vine until the whole thing was complete. Now, this is the analog version of it. You could just kind of plot this into, if you have Photoshop or whatever, and then mirror that image so it's perfect. But not everybody has those programs or is familiar with it, but just about everybody can grab a pen and a paper and make this thing happen. So with my design all locked down, it was time to move on to making the template. I just realized I have this can of Gorilla Glue here. Gorilla Glue, until you become a paid advertiser, you don't get that much screen time. So to make this pattern, you're not gonna need to bust out like a tape measure or anything. All you're gonna need is tin foil, some duct tape, and some super sexy calf action. Simply wrap your shin in the aluminum foil, then layer your duct tape over that. Don't forget the aluminum foil first. Waxing your legs is a completely different skill that we will not be covering on this show. Once all wrapped up, carefully cut it down the back and marvel at just how chicken your legs are. How do they support me? It's like toothpicks holding up a watermelon. Next, I folded my pattern in half and defined my shape for the top and the bottom, cutting them out as I went along. So some important notes here, you wanna make sure that the back side kind of falls down lower on your calf. Otherwise, this is gonna end up digging into the back of your knee and that's not gonna be comfortable. Also in the front and the back down here at the bottom, you're gonna to wanna to make sure it kind of loops up here so that it leaves room for your foot to be able to bend. As always, make sure you check the fit before you commit to cutting your precious leather. It would suck to get everything like to this point and then you go to try it on and nothing fits and it feels uncomfortable. Like, that's a tragedy. All right, now to clean this pattern up, just fold a large piece of paper in half, then position your folded pattern over the seam so you can trace half of it onto the paper. Make any last minute adjustments needed before cutting the whole thing out. This will leave you with a perfectly symmetrical pattern to work from. Now, obviously I wanted to make this pattern so it fits the whole thing, but I'm dumb and I drew the pattern before I had measured everything out. No worries, because I just scanned the thing and I cut out a piece of it and just lengthened the whole thing. That's just a note of how dumb I am. Why don't you cut all your leather out first, know exactly how much space you have to work with, then draw a thing. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> it's terrible. So I printed that out and then I cut this little half of a design onto the side of the paper. It's nothing special, I just kind of cut a pattern that I thought looked neat on the side of this piece and I ended up liking it, so I kept it. After checking if it fit, I used the same paper trick to make sure I made a perfectly symmetrical piece. So now that I have my two patterns ready to go, we can move on to cutting and tooling. 
For this project, I rolled out some beautiful 8 ounce veg tan leather. Then I traced my patterns on and carefully cut everything out with a sharp knife. Again, always make sure your knife is super sharp. A dull knife is a dangerous knife. You're trying to muscle your way through the leather and suddenly your knife lets go and you're missing a thumb. Keep them sharp. Next, I beveled all of my edges with the aptly named Edge Beveler before wetting and slicking them down for a clean, professional look. This really does make a huge difference in the overall look of the piece. Without doing that edge slicking, everything kind of looks grainy on the end and less professional. I check the layout of everything one more time just to make sure it's all matching my master plan. Again, it's always good to check back in with yourself and with the project to make sure you're on the right track before you go too much further. To transfer my pattern, I first wet the leather evenly with a sponge. Then I positioned my design as center as I could and carefully traced over my lines. This leaves the impression in the leather underneath. Now we need to cut this design in, but I, I realized something. With all of these leather videos I've done, I've never gone over how to sharpen your swivel knife. It's really easy and super important for getting really nice clean lines. All you need is some 2000 grit sandpaper, some jeweler's rouge, and a scrap bit of leather. Simply run your knife back along the sandpaper, carefully maintaining the blade's angle the whole way. Then rub your jeweler's rouge onto the flesh side of your leather and use that as a strop to polish the blade. I personally only hone with the sandpaper every once in a while, but I'll hone with the jeweler's rouge like three or four times during a carve. Just keeps everything clean and keeps that blade moving really smoothly throughout the leather. So my freshly sharpened knife made quick work of cutting in my design. To make that design stand out, I went in with my bevel tool and outlined all of my knot work. I also beveled over the vines that were supposed to look like they were going underneath another vine. This helps to add a little extra dimension as it actually makes that vine look like it's going over some pieces and under other pieces, rather than just being on a two-dimensional plane. I also lightly marked those areas with the backgrounder tool so that they'll look shaded once they're dyed. Then I used the backgrounder to fill in all of those open spaces. You don't need to go that fast. I'm just amazing. Stupid joke. Next, I stamped in the trunk of my little tree here with these crescent sunbursts, then made the leaves of my tree with a round cedar stamp. And ta-da! That is my most intricate tooling so far, and I'm super happy with how it came out. And I only use four stamps throughout the whole thing. Um, aside from kind of the carving work or whatever, it's actually, it's a really easy thing to do. You can get some great results with minimal amounts of tools. And all that was from like my, my starter kit that I got from Tandy's, it has like, five or six different stamps in the thing. And with just those, you can make some really cool stuff. Now you of course can use whatever stamps and designs and patterns you wanna use. This is your armor. You're gonna be the epic one charging into battle. You should have some fun designing what you're probably gonna die in, let's be honest. When's the last time you fought with swords? That being said, the person you're going against probably isn't any better. Not a lot of sword fights happening nowadays. This is a damn shame. On the backing piece here, I used a wing divider and cut in the space where my eyelets would live. And this is where I made a discovery. When using the bevel tool, I had always kind of just slowly moved it along the line and hit the hammer straight down as I went. But I found that if you lean the beveler over and use the striking of your hammer to nudge it along, the tooling goes way faster and comes out so much smoother. Here's the line from the old way of doing it. And here's the line using this leaning technique. Now I'm sure some of you are giving me like a hard eye roll, like, yeah, that's how you do it. But I honestly didn't know it. And finding that out, I was like, this is awesome. I'm just kind of alone in the wilderness out here, figuring it all out. So cut me some slack. And once those lines were in place, I punched those eyelet holes as well. Okay, but now that we're all tooled up, it's about time we got to dying. So in all of my past videos, I basically just use like an antique dye to color all of my pieces. As much as you might give me credit by thinking it's like a stylistic choice, I just, I didn't know any better. It's what I had and it's what I used. For this project though, I decided it was time to take off the training wheels and finally die like a big boy. So I started by painting in the background with a USMC black. I used a thin brush to carefully apply the dye around the edges and then filled the space in the middle with a thicker brush. And as tedious as this looks, it really didn't take long at all and the results were instantly satisfying. And Clever's all about instant gratification. Now for my main color here, I decided to go with the saddle tan to match the rest of my armor. To apply it, I put some dye on a rag and blotted it on a sacrificial piece of leather. This was to make sure that the dye went on really smoothly. If I left the rag really wet, then where I put my hand down at first would be darker than everywhere else I dragged it. For the first coat, I was just looking to get color as evenly down as possible. Then I applied the second coat for more depth of color and to make sure everything was evened out. Finally, I used a dauber to just color in those edges. 
I of course repeated this process for all of my pieces, both front and back. And laying them out like this got me so pumped. Already they were looking good and I was so worried about ruining it because I didn't know what I was doing with the dyeing. At this point, I felt kind of in the clear. I was very happy. But the color was still a bit flat. This is where the true purpose of the antiquing product I've been using comes in handy. So here's what I learned. It all starts with a resist. When you put a resist on the leather, all the areas that you put it on resist being dyed any further. So like if you didn't want any of this stuff to be dyed, you can just paint on the resist, let it dry, and then when you apply more dye to it, it will stay neutral and everything else will be dyed. So using a moist sponge, I evenly rubbed the resist onto the surface of my leather and left it to dry. Once completely dry, I grabbed some of this dark brown gel antique and rubbed it into the leather and then immediately removed it afterwards. The antique settles into all the grooves and lines of my leather, adding a whole bunch of contrast and making everything pop. As an added bonus, it also helps even out any of the inconsistencies with your dyeing. I was over the moon with how that came out. And again, because it was my first time trying this, I was so worried about ruining it after all of the tooling work I'd already put into it. Luckily, we have an awesome community and there's always somebody around to help. So that being said, special thanks to Skill Monkey Wall. He's from Australia and he's hoping I'd make a fool of myself by trying my best with an Australian accent. So here we go. Good day, Wall. Oh, I appreciate your help, mate. That's not a knife, that's a knife. Crikey! <laughs> I apologize to just all of Australia. Sincerest apologies. <laughs> all right, with that crime against a whole population of people under my belt, it's time to move on to putting it all together. Now's the time of the show in which we take all the pieces we've made so far and we smash them together to make a beautiful and functional thing. First things first, I dropped in my eyelets and locked them into place using the recommended anvil and striker. Before making my final connections though, I decided to bust up the gum tragacan, laying an even amount along all of my edges and smoothing it out with the slicker brush. This just makes for a really clean finished look. Now to wrap this project up, I carefully positioned my top layer and punched a hole through both pieces. Then I locked them together with a small snap rivet. Then I just continued this all the way around, spacing them out evenly as I went. Finally, I lace these bad boys up and bam! Look at how dope that is! My battle khakis and Adidas of Justice are sold separately. I am just ecstatic with how these came out. They fit perfectly and are by far the most detailed piece I've made so far. Definitely leveled up the skill. Like I would have no problem trying to sell this somewhere or whatever. Like I, I think this came out really nicely. Maybe I'm just kind of patting myself in the back too much, but. I love this thing. If you like them or just kind of like the video in general, why don't you hit me with that thumbs up love and don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I release new content. And just thank you guys for requesting these things. Thank you for requesting things in general. It, it really is cool to have your involvement in everything. And of course, if you guys have a request, leave it down in the comments section and I will add it to the list. All right, I should get going. There's some ass kicking that needs doing and I finally have the right leg wear for the occasion. In the meantime, Keep leveling up, you. <laughs>